Thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Broll, and I'm the Executive Director for the Department of Revenue. And in Colorado, the Department of Revenue has responsibility for collecting all state taxes, income tax, sales tax, oil and gas tax, severance taxes. In addition, we have the Division of Motor Vehicles, where we license drivers as well as vehicles. We have a state lottery division, and we have enforcement. And the enforcement division that is under me has a responsibility for casino gaming, uh, horse racing, automotive dealers, liquor and tobacco, and medical and recreational marijuana. Um, first, I want to tell you uh, just a little bit about how this came to be. The citizens in the state of Colorado have the ability to, at a grassroots level, get together and decide that they want to put something on our ballot that they can then have the entire state vote on, and if the state votes yes, it becomes part of our state constitution and our laws. And that happened uh, back in 2000. It started then with the advent of medical marijuana. Uh, so before 2000, the traditional way of individuals getting marijuana was always through criminal means. In 2000, uh, the, um, it was permitted that individuals could receive medical marijuana for uh, treatment of uh, certain debilitating illnesses. Uh, the next thing that happened is along the way in 2010, our legislature allowed for the regulation and oversight of these medical marijuana businesses, and that is how the Marijuana Enforcement Division came to be and it was created to regulate those industries. And then in 2012, our voters got together again and decided to take a look at whether or not the state wanted to legalize the um, uh, marijuana for recreational use as well, and then put together an, a regulatory oversight. So the thing is, is that the how this came about was not by the government. The state of Colorado, the government did not choose to do this. It was something that the people chose to do. And they didn't choose to do it through for taxation. They were choosing to do it for decriminalization as well as, the, as, as personal freedoms. How we did this, uh, because you know, this was brand new. No one else had ever rolled out an implementation program for the legalization of recreational use of marijuana. So we knew we were the first. We had no model to uh, pattern ourselves after, or even to look to see what was working and what was not. As a result, what we did is we brought together a group of stakeholders. And these are the people that, that became part of our task force and part of our group. So what we had were legislators. We had members from public health. We had physicians. We had uh, people from the industry. We had law professors. Um, uh, attorneys as well as members from the labor and employment groups as well. And the reason that this was important is because all of these groups had um, personal, um, uh, personal opinions about how things would work. They had issues. Some of them were in opposition. Some of them were for this. But what we did is we brought together a group of people that had very opposing viewpoints in many ways. But what was critical was when you bring people together that have very opposing viewpoints, and you identify the issues that you must resolve, and then you come together to resolve them, it's very interesting in that we were able to actually come up with very creative and very uh, reasonable solutions uh, for uh, implementing this program. Now, as I said, we were the first. Um, and as a result, we were in uncharted waters. We really had no model. So what we had to do is identify our goals. And we had guideposts. And that's usually what helps you when you really uh, are going down a path that has never gone down before. And our three guideposts were these. And uh, they were very important to us. They were preventing distribution of marijuana to minors. It was preventing the involvement of criminal enterprises, gangs, and cartels in the legal marijuana industry. And it was also keeping marijuana from leaving our state and going into our neighboring states, our border states. And that was pretty critical because, and what we did is every time we came up with a decision that we had to make or a purpose that we had to do or what the regulation or the law was going to be, 
we modeled back to these three guideposts and we asked ourselves the question, does this help us get closer or does this take us away? So what we did is we implemented regulations for protecting minors and we did it in a number of manners. First, <clears throat> excuse me, we um, limited advertisement uh, and we actually um, uh, prohibit advertisement in media or publication or newspapers that have a high, um, more than 30% uh, demographic of children that we define as people under the age of 21. We also have pretty extensive labeling and packaging requirements. That means when the marijuana leaves the marijuana store, the label has to identify that it has marijuana in it. It has to tell, it has to denote how much THC is in there. It has to say whether it's been lab tested or not, and if so, what the results were. In addition, packaging is really a key thing because what we uh, require is all marijuana that leaves the store must be in a tamper-resistant, child-resistant package. And uh, it, that means that it's hard for children to open. The other thing is it's opaque, so we don't allow for them to be able to see what's inside. That's especially important because not only is the marijuana flower, the marijuana bud legal, but also edibles. And so we have products manufacturers that actually create things like brownies and cookies and candies that are infused with marijuana concentrate. So we need to keep children safe from that perspective. Uh, waste removal, you wouldn't think that that would have anything to do with safety for children, but it is, it does. Uh, we need to make sure that when these businesses um, actually uh, remove their waste, that it's done in locked receptacles so that children can't go into those waste receptacles and try to pull out the leftover marijuana. And finally, we have underage checks. And what that means is because this is limited to adults 21 years of age or older, we go in and we check to see if these businesses are selling to someone under the age of 21. And we have underage operatives that go in and actually try to purchase, and if so, then uh, we do uh, ad I, uh, impose administrative sanctions on them. And, and those administrative sanctions, quite frankly, can um, range from warning letters to fines up to $100,000 to suspension of um, the business model and the license, and the, uh, so unable to uh, uh, actually be open for a certain length of time all the way to and up to including revocation of the license. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Koski, who is the head of the Marijuana Enforcement Division under my department. And he will talk about how uh, the compliance and uh, other uh, enforcement activities work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barb, and thank you all for having us. Uh, it's uh, been real exciting being here in Switzerland all week and uh, uh, really enjoying learning a lot from uh, you all as much as we are sharing with what we're doing in Colorado. And so what I wanted to do is just start off with that, the second guidepost that, that Barb was talking about earlier when we're talking about limiting criminal enforcement, I'm sorry, limiting criminal uh, activity within the enforced area of the regulatory environment. And really what we do is, is we're, we're, we've started from the beginning when businesses actually come in to get licensed, we start with a, a real robust background investigation. And so what that means is, is that when a company, before they can ever operate, they have to get licensed. Part of the licensing process then means that they apply on applications and they have to disclose certain things to us. And then we uh, do background investigation checks on all of those disclosures to make sure that they're in compliance with the law. So during the licensing process, people are, uh, are not allowed to have certain circumstances in their background. For example, uh, uh, anyone who's had drug convictions, felony drug convictions in the past, simply don't qualify for licensing, especially if they're really recent. Uh, the other thing, too, that we look at is we look at government obligations to make sure that the owners of these companies 
uh, have uh, uh, paid all of their taxes, uh, that they're current on their government insured student loans, uh, and that uh, uh, they're current on any other type of government obligation that might be out there. So they have to go through a certain vetting process. And again, that's the intent behind that is to make sure that we're licensing people uh, that are of good moral character and that uh, they don't bring with them uh, an extensive criminal history. Because if we were to do that, then it would really lessen the credibility of the industry by uh, starting out off on the wrong foot. Now, once we get businesses licensed, then there's a number of different uh, enforcement activities that they're subjected to as well. So we routine, routinely do inspections of the businesses to make sure that they're in compliance with a number of different things. Uh, one uh, example is, is that the businesses are required at the locations that they operate to have a, a really comprehensive surveillance system and they have to keep that footage at the, the license premise for, for 40 days. So if we were to have a problem, uh, we could ask them to pull up video footage uh, from, uh, from just a little bit over a month. The other thing that we're developing now too, because we have limited resources, we have hundreds of, of licensees within the state of Colorado and we have limited number of enforcement agents to be out in the field doing inspections. So we do routinely do risk assessments where we're identifying companies that are behaving in a high risk manner and what we do is then we dedicate our resources and direct them towards the licensees that are most likely to be offending uh, the violations. And so that risk assessment's really helpful, but part of that risk assessment too then is, is the idea that we get complaints. So we, we get a lot of phone calls. So to answer the question uh, from, that was posed earlier uh, to me is whether or not we're less busy, we're still very busy. This is a, a, a unique program uh, and we're, we're uh, writing a lot of this as we're, we're going forward. And, and so we, we end up being pretty busy with a number of different complaints that come in some of which are, are people seeking clarification on, on behavior at one of our licensed premises. Other ones might just be really serious violations that of course we uh, direct our attention to right away. Uh, the last thing I wanna to talk to you about with respect to limiting uh, criminal behavior within the regulated environment is our, uh, our uh, inventory tracking system. And it's very important for us. It's a, it's a centralized computer system where all of our licensees have to report their inventory. And they have to report their inventory from the time the plant is a, a tiny little baby plant all the way up until the time that it's harvested at a cultivation, packaged, and then shipped to the retail store. All of that's done within a, a computerized system that the state of Colorado can look into either on a licensee by licensee basis to make sure that they're in compliance uh, with the rules, are they acting in a risky way? And then it also uh, enables us to uh, be able to look at the system and see aggregate data. So for example, when I left uh, last Friday from Colorado to come to Switzerland, we had right around 600,000 plants that were reported into the system from our licensees. So uh, it really is gonna help us uh, to better understand some of the dynamics within the industry. Now very closely related to that is uh, limiting diversion uh, to bordering states. Clearly this is criminal activity because every state around the state of Colorado uh, finds marijuana to be completely illegal regardless of whether uh, you're a medical patient or not. So uh, what we've, we're working on right now is a, a market demand study and that market demand study uh, we think is going to tell us what it, the overall demand from any segment of the marijuana industry, whether it be the white market, uh, the gray market, or the black market, what that overall demand is for marijuana in the state of Colorado. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna craft regulations that allow us to uh, regulate to that amount. And then of course, we'll keep updating that amount as time goes on. So uh, that's a, a real important indicator. And, and back to the inventory tracking system, we really think that the data that we're compiling in there is going to help uh, substantiate the work that we're doing on the market study. And it's also going to really help us uh, better understand uh, those regulations as we get into more of those stakeholder groups that Barb was talking about. 
And then just one last point, and I want to turn this back over to, to Barb, is, is in addition to the technology that we use to help craft our regulations to uh, have a better understanding of the accountability of marijuana in the state of Colorado, there's some other restrictions as well. So for example, our stores are only uh, allowed to be open from 8 until midnight. Uh, if, uh, from a retail perspective. And a local dur jurisdiction can actually limit those hours. They can make it uh, from 8 uh, till 6. They can make them close on Sundays. The local jurisdictions have that ability to, and flexibility to create uh, restrictions at their, uh, in their own areas. And then the other thing I think is really important to understand, because a lot of times we get asked the question about people coming in from uh, outside of the state of Colorado to buy marijuana. The way our constitutional amendment was written is it allows anyone over 21 that's in the state of Colorado to possess one ounce of marijuana. So that doesn't necessarily restrict them to just Colorado citizens. What we have done though is we restricted the amount that a citizen can buy to one ounce. Someone from outside of the state of Colorado can only buy uh, one quarter of an ounce. And with that one quarter of an ounce, they still have to consume it while they're in the state of Colorado. And that can be a little bit difficult because we also have laws that say that you cannot uh, uh, smoke marijuana or consume marijuana either on any of our licensed premises or openly and publicly. And so that, that helps to uh, keep things within the four corners uh, uh, of the state of Colorado and it, and it limits uh, diversion. So uh, I'm going to hand this back over to Barb so she can kind of uh, uh, provide you with a few closing thoughts from us. Thank you, Lewis. Um, so, one of the things that uh, we wanted that was also asked of us was uh, with regard to taxation and uh, making money off of uh, addiction. Uh, the one thing that we also realized was that there is a cost associated with marijuana use. Uh, and it could be in a number of areas. And so what we determined was that the marijuana industry and marijuana use and users should bear the, uh, the expense of any of the social programs and social issues that surround this industry. So as a result, there is additional taxation that had to go to our voters because our voters must approve any increase or any new taxes. And they said yes, and the taxation money then is being used to fund the regulations and the enforcement and the whole regulatory program. It's also going to fund any new treatment, uh, prevention, and especially educational programs. Uh, and education meaning helping parents and teachers to understand uh, the issues around um, young people uh, using marijuana. So that's what that money will be going towards. But the one thing that I wanted to talk about was just in, in closing several things. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, we use stakeholder groups. That was a very key uh, point for us because what that does is it creates kind of what we call negotiated rules. And so everyone around the table at the end finally is in agreement. And what that does is it's, it's showed us that it really increases voluntary compliance by the businesses and it also increases um, because that, that, and that participation is so key to that. But the other thing that it does, which is really important to us, is it allows for flexibility to make changes because it, you're not going to get it right the first time. You have to build in the flexibility, at least we did, to be able to, if we found something that we needed to do differently, to bring people back together and say, okay, here's the problem. And we've actually done that more than once now. And then that group that we talked about at the beginning helps to create the solution. Um, so as, um, and as I mentioned with the guideposts, you know, it was really key for us to do that too because it is, marijuana use is still illegal at the federal level in the, in the U.S. It's only legal in Colorado and Washington. So our guideposts had to uh, be consistent with our federal guidance that we received. They created comprehensive regulations and made sure we were doing the right things. And then it parallels the intent of the state constitutional amendment. So what that means is that we try to remain very, very true to what the amendment said because that's what our people wanted. 
So in closing, I want to just make one comment, and it's the thing that I say every time that I speak in front of a group of people, because I think it's extremely important that you know this about us, and that is that the Department of Revenue and the Marijuana Enforcement Division, we take this responsibility very, very seriously. Uh, we know that um, the whole world is watching us, and we know that some of the world wants us to succeed, and we know that some want us to fail. So, uh, but this is an important, an important thing from the perspective of child safety and public safety, and we want to, and health, and we want to make certain that we're doing it correctly. And as I mentioned, we have our guideposts, and so the other thing that we've done is we have made sure that we have tried to roll this out in a very thoughtful and a predictable and a controlled manner to make sure that we are staying true to our guideposts in children's safety and public safety and health. So thank you so much for letting us come and talk to you, and um, uh, we love Switzerland.